and I'd like to welcome you to today's program, A Court Divided. Um, I'd like to take uh, this opportunity to thank today's faculty, not all of whom, but most of whom are visibly present here this morning, for their time in coming here to speak to you today and also for the time that they've put into preparing the materials um, which are in your binders. CLE is a non-profit uh, arm of the Law Society and we rely upon the generosity of faculty like today's for their time and effort in presenting these programs to you. I'd also like to um, thank Quick Law who um, has uh, generously provided you with um, the uh, computerized format of um, some of the cases that will be referred to in today's talks. Uh, they did this uh, gratis and uh, we very much appreciate it. They have a little bit of a display out on a table um, right next to the coffee. You might want to take a look and see what uh, they have to offer. So um, that said, um, oh, also if you're missing chapter A in your book, Bill Pentney's paper. It is available. Uh, it should have been stuffed in the binders, but if you are missing it, you can pick it up at the um, at the break. And David uh, Corbett will speak to you personally about his paper. Um, and so now I'd like to introduce uh, you, uh, the chair of this morning's program, David. David Corbett is a partner at Tory Tory Delorier in Binnington, uh, and uh, he was called to the bar in uh, 1987. He's an instructor at Osgoode Hall Law, uh, Law School at York and the University of Toronto, as well as the Ontario Centre for Advocacy Training and the Law Society of Upper Canada Bar Admissions Course. He's a director of the, at the Foundation for Equal Families and the Lesbian, Gay and Bisexual Youth Hotline. He's been a frequent speaker at continuing legal education conferences in the areas of construction law, corporate commercial litigation, advocacy, uh, alternative dispute resolution, and sexual orientation in the law. Without further ado, I'd like to turn the program over to David. Thank you. Thank you, Laurel. Uh, before we begin today, I'd like to especially thank uh, Laurel Evans and uh, Paul Truster. Paul's not in the room at the moment, uh, who are at the Law Society of Upper Canada, who've uh, provided uh, tremendous encouragement and enthusiasm for this program. Uh, I suggested it to them before the decision in Egan came down and said, look, uh, when Egan comes down in Miron Trudel, uh, we expect the law around Section 15 will change. Uh, we don't know how it will change, and in fact, uh, the results were, were not at all anticipated, uh, at least not by me. Uh, but uh, I suggested that uh, it would be a very good idea to mount a conference shortly afterwards, and they're very enthusiastic about it. And I have to say that in pulling this together in fairly short order, they have really uh, gone the extra yard to try to make this happen. Uh, there's something about this conference. We've uh, had little pitfalls all the way along the way, which, which have nothing to do with anybody's, uh, uh, anybody not pulling their weight. I wanted to bring somebody today, an academic um, with uh, impeccable credentials and who's very much in the mainstream, who would argue for the positions taken by Justice Laforet in Egan and uh, Justice Gontier in Miron Trudel. Uh, the short answer to the question is, there is no one in this country who will do that. I think that's pretty significant. I'm going to say a little bit more about that when I come to address you later on. There are those who will explain it. There are those who will describe the antecedents to it. Uh, but I could not find any academic in this country, in a law school, who would actually stand up and defend it. Uh, I'm not saying there's no such person, but if there is, I don't know who it is. Uh, and I think that's something interesting to ponder as we go through these decisions. Uh, the second thing, uh, and, and we, we did hunt around uh, for a while to try to find someone who would do that without success, um, but we now have a program of speakers who I think have very interesting and different things to say about these cases, uh, and uh, although that particular approach will not be before you today, I hope that you'll be able to uh, divine the wisdom of the approach of Laforet and Gantier from their own words uh, while, uh, while you hear what the rest of us have to say about it. Uh, the other problem that, uh, that happened was that yesterday morning at 7.30 in the morning, my portable computer, along with the backup disk, was stolen, which is why you don't have a paper for me today. But you will get it in the mail uh, when I reassemble it. Um, I, I went up for a walk at 7 o'clock in the morning, came back, went upstairs, brushed my teeth, and somebody walked in the front door of my house and swiped it. Uh, so this was a little alarming. Um, but that's why you don't have a paper for me today. Uh, but you will have one in due course. And I have lots to say. <laughs> 
this way you actually have to listen to me. You can't sit there and browse my paper. But uh, I, I see that Laurel has, a, has given a, an estimate of the sort of substance of what I'm going to say by inserting two pieces of paper where my paper was supposed to be. So uh, that would be the sum total of the notes that, uh, that, that emanate from that. Um, Bill Pentney is our first speaker. Uh, <coughs> Bill was a professor at the University of Ottawa uh, for seven years and is currently general counsel at the Canadian Human Rights Commission. Um, and I uh, thought of Bill as a speaker for this program both because of his writing. Um, he's written a revised edition of Discrimination of the Law in Canada and the Law in Canada, which was originally written by Justice Tarnopolsky, and co-authored Human Rights and Freedoms in Canada with uh, M.L. Berlin. Uh, he has extensive experience in the area of human rights, and he argued uh, Egan on behalf of the Canadian Human Rights Commission uh, in their interve intervention in that case. He's going to speak to us today about the Section 1 analysis. Uh, I understand that his remarks are going to be a little more broad-ranging than that. Uh, I understand he's going to be more broad-ranging than that as well, because he has got one of those portable mics so that he can zip all around the room and terrorize the cameraman. Uh, without further ado, Bill Pentney. Thank you. I should say that the last time I tried to do this at the university, I hung myself for a period of time, so uh, I just have to bear with me for a second while I get this thing. Uh, I want to make believe that I'm an academic again, so this is the nearest thing that I can do to that. I'd like to thank the organizers. <laughs> I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to. Well, I'd like to thank them and damn them all at the same time because. I'd read the decisions one by one and obviously paid very careful attention to Egan, which was of direct and primary importance to the Canadian Human Rights Commission in light of the cases that we're now doing uh, at tribunal and trying to settle uh, during the course of investigation in respect of uh, same-sex benefits in, in the employment and governmental context. Um, and I obviously read the other decisions as well, but by being asked to talk about the three together, it really forced me to try to put them together. And that's how I propose to talk about them, not one by one, but really uh, together. The title of my paper is Too Much to Expect, But Not Too Much to Ask. It's, I guess I, I come here not really to, to talk only about Justice Lafaudet's decision in Egan or Gonchi and Mirren. I, I've been uh, through this uh, process of putting the three together and looking at what the court has tried to do, uh, I've been starting to think maybe that Andrews isn't such a very good thing either. Uh, and what I'd like to present to you are some ideas about, first of all, Section 15 and its relationship with Section 1, which really ties, or I, I try to relate, to conceptions of deference and legitimacy in terms of judicial review. All through the Charter and all through Charter cases, we see stories being told by courts about what it is they think they've been asked to do in interpreting the Charter. Now basically we know the outline of the story, but I'd like to suggest that Section 15 has caused the court, because of the way it's drafted, because of the problems that it confronts, because of its breadth and possible reach, it confronts the judges with new questions about this project of judicial review that they're being asked to engage in. I'd like to talk a little bit about, first of all, what it is that we expect of our judges under judicial review. Second, and related to that, what's it fair to ask of judges engaged in judicial review? I'd like to do that in two ways. First of all, in terms of trying to figure out what it is we want, by looking at the text itself. I have a very simple thesis that if you're interpreting a written charter of rights, you should at a minimum pay some attention to the words. Simple. Uh, but I think it's a good place to start and it's remarkable if you look at these decisions, how little attention has been paid to the words or how we got those words. I'd like to talk very briefly, although it's, uh, it's outlined a bit more on my paper and I'd like to expand on it uh, as this paper gets itself revised. I'd like to talk as well about the history of Section 15. My thesis here is that Section 15 started off three years behind the rest of the provisions and it hasn't caught up. That Section 15 uh, expectations were developed that were frankly unrealistic given the tenor of the jurisprudence at the time we started doing equality rights, particularly in the Supreme Court of Canada. By 1986, the heyday of the Charter was essentially gone. Those early glorious decisions had been turned, in a sense. And so we catch the Charter on the downward slope as we start to do equality. I'd then like to look at the trilogy. And as I look at the trilogy of cases, what I've tried to do is to divide the court into factions to try to make sense of it. I don't know how many of you do equality rights, but basically that's what I do. 
And what I've been thinking about ever since I started to read these decisions and think about this is, imagine the poor lawyer who's got to do the next one. I, I expect to be in the court in the fall probably, and thank God it's a human rights case where we still have at least some sort of a framework of analysis. But imagine trying to do the next charter case. Who is it that you'd look to as you stand at that wonderful podium waiting for the red light to come on? Okay, you can, you can look at Le Maire. You can look at the, the group of four. You can look at the Andrews purists. I should start. You can look at the Andrews purists. There's a solid group of three Andrews purists on the court, clearly from this trilogy. There's the, the individualist, Madam Justice Lydia Dubay, and I'll come back and talk about why I think she's an individualist. Um, there's the relevant four, um, who were a solid group, probably the most consistent of the group on the court, as you look at these three decisions. Um, and then there's the wandering soul, Mr. Justice Sapinka. Um, as you look through his decisions, there's, there's some very inexplicable things that are, that are done, and I'll try and describe how, I think, as you look at the trilogy, you can see what the, what, what is going on within the court, which is the separation into factions and the search for some new frontiers, some new approaches. And the final thing I'd like to do very briefly is to talk about what I think this means for law and lawyering in terms of equality rights. Um, and in doing that, I'd like to try and step back from Andrews because there is a tendency in these decisions and in a lot of the academic analysis to take Andrews as we took Oakes as the fixed star against which all must be measured in terms of its rightness or goodness. I think that's hogwash. Andrews was never really all that very good to start with. Andrews combined with the Section 1 approach that the court adopted was really not very good if you wanted equality from the court. So I would like to suggest that maybe it's uh, along with the judges we could step back from Andrews and try to figure out again what it is that we expect as a society. Now I'm going to do all of that and leave some time for questions. Um, so buckle up, I suppose, is the message. The text of the Charter. Where did we get this Section 1 from? I won't describe the history of Section 15. You all know that Section 15 was evolved in part to take account of all of the problems that had arisen under the Canadian Bill of Rights. It was drafted with a view to the negative, if you like. What was to be avoided? So we get equality before and behind and between and through and around and sort of next to the law. We get it without discrimination and we get it without discrimination on the basis of a whole series of listed grounds. It's a very awkwardly worded equality guarantee. Max Cohen, when he was testifying before the Special Joint Committee looking at the, the draft of the Charter as it then was, said that a Charter of Rights should sound a Jericho. It should stand for all time as a signal of what it is that people believe. Well, Section 15 is not much of a clarion call to anything. It's a lawyer's text. Now, what about Section 1, which is what I'm supposed to be talking about here uh, uh, along the way? Well, if you look at the history of Section 1, it was inserted into the Charter again in reflection or, or in response to the Canadian Bill of Rights doctrine. Disappointment with what the court had done under the Canadian Bill of Rights led the drafters of the Charter to start looking at an express limitations clause of some sort. Very early drafts of the Charter included limitations within each provision. The thing was chock full of limitations and restrictions and apologies. Eventually that came to be replaced with a handy dandy one size fits all limitations clause, which is what basically we're left with now. The original, uh, one of the original drafts said that uh, the Charter should guarantee rights subject only to such limits as are generally accepted in a free and democratic society with a parliamentary form of government. Some of you may remember that was labeled the Mack Truck Clause because it was felt that a government could load all of its arguments into a vehicle of that size and drive right through the rights without even stopping. It wouldn't even really a toll gate at that stage. So there was a lot of emphasis in the drafting of the Charter on efforts to try to narrow the limitations. Now those that were involved in those discussions, I think we should recall, had some very significant ideas in mind about the framework for analysis that they wanted followed. They wanted the onus placed squarely on government to justify limitations. They wanted that onus to be satisfied only where government could bring forward specific and substantive evidence rather than simply appeals to tradition or administrative convenience. They wanted evidence to be brought forward to justify infringing the limitations of rights. They wanted to set an outside boundary beyond which no government could go. And the example that was talked about then was torture. 
No government in situations, no matter how extreme, could justify as fundamental a violation of rights as that. They wanted a fixed boundary to be set at the extreme. And within that, they wanted the rights to be guaranteed. If you look at the words of Section 1, the first thing that strikes me is they open with words of promise. The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees the rights and freedoms set out in it subject only to such limits, subject only to such limits as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. It guarantees the rights and it says that other types of limits are not to creep in and infect the analysis. If you're going to justify a limitation on rights, you better do it under Section 1, says the text of the Charter, as I read it. And as I understand the history, that's what the drafters wanted. It should be subject only to such reasonable limits as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. Now, through the history of that text, it seems that the courts caught the constitutional fervor. They came to understand that Canadians took these rights seriously and that politicians were investing the judges with a great deal of legitimacy. That message comes through very clearly in the early charter decisions. If you look at that first five years of charter decision making, you find very strong decisions coming from a confident court secure in the knowledge that what it's doing is legitimate in terms of our overall scheme of government. Justice Lafferty in the VC Motor Vehicle Act uh, reference says it expressly that the interpretation of the charter should be, ex should be approached free from any lingering doubts as to legitimacy. He says, the politicians made us do it. They gave us this authority and we're going to exercise it. That's also reflected in the Oaks test, which again has come to be seen as some sort of fixed beacon against which all standards of good and rightness must be judged. In the Oaks test, we know the court tried to establish a two-stage form of inquiry to determine whether limits are reasonable or not. I'll come back to Oaks a, a little bit because uh, the trilogy really revolves around uh, reflections of Andrews and reflections of Oaks. But in terms of the interpretation of the Charter and the interpretation of Section 1, you start with Oaks, very quickly go through Edward's books and end up at, uh, in Irwin Toy. So that by the time, and we, we know that at this point as well, Section 15 has not yet come into effect. It's delayed for three years so that governments can get their houses in order. So Section, section 15 starts out three years behind the rest, and in that sense, I, I would argue, by the time the case has reached the Supreme Court, it had really missed the heyday of the Charter. Look at what the Court's saying, and one of the strongest proponents on the Court, in terms of what it is the Courts ought to do. This is Edwards' books, right? 1986, I think. The courts, says uh, Chief Justice Dixon, are not called upon to substitute judicial opinions for legislative ones as to the place at which to draw a precise line. In Oaks, the court was drawing very firm lines, and in the criminal law cases, the court was very clearly drawing lines, not just about procedural guarantees, but about substantive guarantees. As it came to confront more complicated questions, the court very noticeably retreated. And one of the interesting things is you can look at, at, at the decisions of the court and the extent to which the court has retreated from some of its earlier ones and marvel about how quickly all of this has occurred. One of the comments I would make about the court's charter jurisprudence is that it really has not achieved any lasting significance. Right? You can look at a whole series of very abrupt reversals in the criminal law domain. You can look at more general doctrinal reversals and wanderings in terms of equality rights, in terms of Section 1, in terms of fundamental freedoms, as the courts tried to struggle with some of these fundamental questions. My thesis there, although it's a separate one and not really properly uh, to be explored here, is essentially that the court has been much too ambitious in trying to establish this unremitting framework. They didn't really know what they were getting into as they were dealing with early cases, I think. And as they began to deal with more difficult cases, they found that the doctrines they tried to create weren't adequate to the task. And so they beat a hasty retreat. They stepped back from the precipice and decided that really they better go at this a little bit more slowly. What is it that we expect of the courts under Section 15 and Section 1? Well, I think that the drafting history shows us what we expect. We expect the courts to approach government exercises of authority with skepticism. We expect governments to be put to some tests. We expect the court to try to channel government's behavior into ways that would more adequately and carefully consider their infringement of rights. What's it fair to ask of the judges? Well, that's a question that really turns on one's personal opinion, and I'll come back at the end to, to talk about some expectations that I think are fairly imposed on the court. 
The history of the development of, of uh, Section 15 and Section 1 would indicate that, as I say, we were catching Section 1 as it was going uh, on the downside. The court was stepping back from engaging in line drawing. But as we apply that thinking and approach to Section 15 in equality cases, we see the difficulty that immediately emerges. Equality cases in the constitutional context are all about line drawing. We've got to keep it in our mind. I, I think that I originally thought that it was a good idea that the court had sought inspiration in interpreting Section 15 by looking to human rights law. I'm starting to wonder whether that really was such a good thing because, of course, there are very different imperatives at play. In human rights law, by and large, we deal with the interest of a private employer that's seeking really only one, uh, one goal or, or objective rather than trying to compete or balance or mediate among competing interests. Courts have not deferred very much in human rights law to private employers, and that's probably appropriate. They probably shouldn't in this society. But what it's meant is that we can focus a lot of our attention in human rights law on methods of uh, justification for employers that turn out ultimately to be calls to rationality. Can you as an employer show me why you're adopting this policy or practice now? And is it rational that you do so? Given, given your context and given our interest in promoting human rights. As you apply that to the state, it seems to me that the court has missed some very important issues. Basically the issue being that we're looking here at controlling state action. We should ask therefore the state to explain its action and pay attention to what the state has done in trying to explain its action. I don't believe that the court has done that very well in the early equality cases. If you look at Andrews, for example, Andrews is a, a nice case, interesting case, but a very odd equality case when you look at it. Andrews is about whether lawyers can, can control who gets to, to practice by keeping out some that aren't yet fit to practice, or whether an Oxford trained lawyer and some other uh, nice people ought to get admittance to the practice of law. You'll notice in Andrews, as I look at it, a tremendous exercise of judicial imagination. The court doesn't talk about lawyers, skips and at the equality analysis anyway, it skips lightly over the fact that we're dealing with lawyers and all of a sudden we're talking about sturdy men in sheepskin jackets and their, for, and their, and the, their predecessors, the, the Chinese laborers who were imported into Canada and, and who were subject to all sorts and all manner of discriminatory laws. All of a sudden what we're engaged in here, I would submit, is largely judicial imagination. We've now moved beyond the question of whether or not this regulation of lawyers is fit or is it discriminatory, and we've assimilated this particular claimant to all sorts of other claimants whose evidence was never before the court, whose situation was never considered, and who are basically of historical interest at this stage. I mean, there is discrimination against uh, uh, people born elsewhere, make no doubt about it, but it isn't operating in the way that the court describes it in this society today. And really there was no evidence called about how it's operating and no consideration called about that sort of a context. But nevertheless, the judges go merrily along their way in Andrews and, and apply a, a type of Section 15 analysis. That's a very odd framework within which to start our equality uh, analysis, I would submit, by exercising judicial imagination, by abstracting from the situation of the group before the court to some broader mythical historical group, not mythical, broader historical group, and giving effect to the myths that we believe uh, to have been at play as that historical group was mistreated by Canadian society. It's, it's interesting, it has not much to say about what the situation is of immigrant workers today. Uh, this wasn't a case where domestics intervened to try to explain the situation that, uh, that they face. Now we come to the trilogy now. With that kind of a background, a certain set of very high expectations that I would submit, given the history and evolution of the Charter, were destined to be disappointed, along comes the, tr uh, the trilogy. Interesting things about the trilogy I I'd note at the outset. Three different decisions involving different sets of facts, different laws, different courts, different times, all released by the court at the same time. Clearly the court's trying to send a signal to all of the members of the, of the bar and judiciary and elsewhere about what it thinks about equality rights. First point. Second point is clearly the court has sent uh, uh, a signal and it's a signal that they can't agree. Uh, we're not really sure about the extent to which they can't agree because there are 
as I look at all three decisions, there are some remarkable similarities. All of them, all of the judges line themselves up and pay homage to Andrews. No one's departing from Andrews. Everyone's giving effect to Andrews. It's just that no one else really understands what I understand about Andrews. First point on all the factions of the court. Second point, they're all paying homage to Oaks. The analysis of several of them should call upon a fundamental review of what's going on in Oaks about what judges are doing in judicial review. But none of them do that. None of the justices have the temerity to really take Oaks on and do it again. Not even Madam Justice Luda Dubain. She's willing to take on Andrews again and says she's trying to do it again, just do it better this time, really giving effect to the underlying purpose, just getting it right. But she's not willing to take on Oaks. In terms of judicial review, we're stuck with that as a, as a fixture in the firmament. Now, how do you understand the trilogy? Well, what I've tried to do is to look at the factions within the court. And I think that there are three factions and one that I'm not really sure of, if I can call them. I'm not sure if Justice Apinka forms a faction or, or what it is. I'll come back to him. I'm not really sure how to explain or understand what it is he's trying to do. The first faction are the Andrews purists. The Andrews purists are clearly Justice McLaughlin, Corey, and Iacobucci. I would put Justice Sapinka in there as well. And what are the Andrews purists doing? Well, first of all, they're defending against the barbarians at the gate. They're seeking to, to very directly attack the approach of the relevant four led by Gonche and Lafaudet. And the amount of cross-referencing in this decision is unusual for the, for the court, but also, I think, very uh, informative in terms of what the court is trying to do and what it's thinking about. The key in Andrews is that the court is willing to presume discrimination to have occurred where a distinction has been drawn on one of the listed or analogous grounds. The whole focus of the inquiry is on the grounds. Equality, a violation of equality rights is almost a given in all of these cases. We just pass over that very easily in terms of Section 15 elements of analysis. Denial of equality before or under or between courts have no problem finding that in all of these cases, as is probably appropriate. The focus of the inquiry is on the ground. If the distinction has been drawn on the basis of one of those grounds, the court is willing to presume discrimination and put the onus on government to justify the discrimination. Justice McLaughlin mounts a defense of that basic Andrews approach on theoretical grounds as being consistent with how we understand rights and freedoms in the Charter, that the courts are enjoined to give rights and freedoms a very broad and liberal interpretation without any fears about the ultimate impact of such an interpretation because after all we can, take, we can blunt the impact of that if we need to under Section 1 and the courts have indicated a very ready willingness to blunt that impact under Section 1. But we're going to deal with Section 15 broadly. We're going to say that it should not set too high a hurdle in situations of what we traditionally think of as disadvantage, stereotyping on the basis of group characteristics. They're also going to give effect, though, to the other side of, of the Andrews bargain. My thesis is that Andrews struck a bargain. The court is not going to protect aluminum beer can manufacturers and margarine producers and all of those other neat interests that were bringing equality claims very early on. The court's going to narrow and personalize the impact of Section 15. That's one part of the bargain and get rid of all these other economic and other types of claims. The other part of the bargain, though, is that the court is going to set a meaningful standard of judicial review. That's the promise of Andrews, that we're going to narrow the scope of Section 15 somewhat but at the same time, we're going to make the review meaningful. And how do we make it meaningful? How do we second guess legislative distinctions? Well, we're going to say, first of all, to legislatures, thou shalt not, which is basically what Andrews is saying, thou shalt not make distinctions on the basis of the listed or analogous categories. It's a very clear, not so subtle direction to legislators. Get rid of those sorts of distinctions or face serious consequences if you, if you want to uphold them in terms of our interpretation of Section 15. That's essentially what the Andrews purists are trying to defend. They're trying to say that we as a court are going to defend those traditional interests, trying to understand them in context, and we're going to take serious steps to defend them. We're not going to set a very low threshold. Now, in, in looking at line drawing, though, once the analysis moves to Section 1, 
we see that the Andrews purists are very ready to step back. It seems to me quite remarkable what some, of the, what some of the judgments conclude in terms of what ultimate equality guarantee the court is willing to provide, even among the Andrews purists. If you look at what Madam Justice McLaughlin does in, in some of these decisions, she really is holding the government simply to a, a rationality standard. Is there a rational basis in Thibodeau for the inclusion deduction system? We know that in Thibodeau, the facts are that very often the theory underlying the legislative program, which the court finds to be a good one, maximizing income available for the support of the, fam or of the child, great theory, we know and the court accepts, at least the, the, the Andrews purists accept, that that doesn't work very much. In a great many cases, and not an insignificant number of cases, that simply does not work itself out in practice. Madam Justice McLaughlin, though, says, but it's not completely irrational. So therefore, I'm going to find that it meets the basic test of rationality review. I'm going to strike it down, she says, only because I find there are better alternatives that are available, less discriminatory alternatives that are available. I, that, to me, is a remarkable statement about how far we're going to go in protecting equality rights and what kind of burdens we're going to put on claimants. Because where do these alternatives come from? Having been involved in some of these cases, and with due respect to my friends on the other side, it's not in the government's interest to come up and put before the court less discriminatory alternatives. Why would you do that if you were representing a government? You'd say, no, no, this is the way. It's my way or the highway. There's only one way to achieve this goal. Because you know that once you present the, the court with alternatives, you're opening up an avenue for the challenge program to be struck. The alternatives come from the plaintiffs, the, the, the claimants, or the interveners, or from the judicial imagination. Now, as an approach to equality making and equality law, I find that remarkable. I'll come back to that in, in a bit. That's the Andrews purists. There's a, there's a definite attempt by the court to undermine other types of analysis. Although they're polite, they don't mention Madam Justice Lede Dubé. There are very clear attacks by Madam Justice McLaughlin on the approach of Justice Gonche in Miron and of Justice Lafaude in Egan. Very clear and distinct. She's gone out of her way to point out the problems with their approach. Now there's the individualist, Madam Justice Lede Dubé. I call her an individualist for obvious reasons. First of all, because she's so alone. No one even really mentions in any detail her approach. And she's consistent. She's not just written this once in the hopes that it would be the call to the wisdom of a future day. She's going to stick with this and she's going to hammer away at it through all three decisions. She's going to write separately. No, I concur for her. She's going to write and explain how her analysis ought to be applied and shall be applied in these three. Although she agrees in the outcome with the Andrews purists in the cases, she's taking a very different approach. She's also an individualist in another way as well. She, although Andrews situates us all as members of groups and understands us all as members of groups and gives us equality protections essentially as members of groups, I would argue. It's an indirect form of measuring discrimination. We say discrimination exists when the state has classified or has acted in a way that has the effect of classifying on the basis of a group characteristic. That's what discrimination is, according to Andrews. Madam Justice Lede Dubé is trying to separate out the individual from the group, to some extent, and to look more directly, to confront more directly the question of what is discrimination. She's positing a new test here in order to try to, I would, I would argue, let us look more directly at the question of whether or not there is discrimination by measuring the impact of the law or practice on the individual, and the impact on the interests that, that the individual is seeking to protect or further, or says that have been infringed. She says that Andrews has led the court into what she calls rocky shoals. I think that what she's thinking of are a series of cases where the court has found it necessary to take what I would call fairly heroic measures to, to turn gymnastic uh, jumps in order to avoid having to deal with some of the uncomfortable consequences of Andrews. I think if you look at a case like Hess, 
You see the problems the, uh, as the court tries to confront some of these issues. There's a whole series of cases subsequent to Andrews where the court, I would argue, has not done a very good job of explaining how it's applying Andrews step by step. I think what Madam Justice Lydia DeBay is trying to do is to step back from all of this and to say, look, Andrews is just one example of equality analysis. There's something much deeper and more profound going on, and what's, what's going on is the protection of individual dignity. She says that's a situation, I think, she doesn't really say it, I think what she's saying as well is that this is something that courts are good at doing and can do confidently, this protection of individual dignity. That's what all those legal rights cases are about, after all, fundamentally grounded on the protection of individual dignity. She says, as long as we, we apply equality rights to the alchemy of Andrews, as long as we're stuck in that analytical framework, we're only doing indirect equality review. She wants to do direct equality review. And the, the features of that, I would suggest, are extricating the individual from the group, looking more directly at the nature of the interests being affected, and then trying to understand it all in the general social context within which the law is operating. She's got a couple of things, I think, quite right. First of all, she has fixed her mind clearly on the fact that we are dealing with a state actor violating equality rights. She's not mixing up state and employer, private employer anymore. She's got it fixed clearly in her mind that this is about directing, prompting, and controlling the actions of states through legislators, legislatures through public officials. She's trying to say, let's look at this directly and understand what it is that we're trying to control here. She says that let's focus on an appropriate understanding of what the purpose of the law is. Under Andrews and under the approach of the relevant four, there's a great room for leeway in defining the purpose of the law. A great deal of the analytical work of the court is done once that purpose has been defined under those two approaches. Under her approach, Madam Justice Lou Dubé is trying to take a more careful analysis of what the purpose of the law is. To fix it not through judicial imagination, not through the invocation of mythical history, but rather to look at how it operates, as she says, in everyday lives, in everyday society. That surely is something good to be added to equality analysis. Now, a question that we're left with, I suppose, is whether or not anyone other than Madam Justice Ledoux de Bay and perhaps some academics, is really going to pick up this analysis and move it forward. She's clearly attempted to set the course, uh, set a new course to explore a new frontier in terms of equality analysis. But it is remarkable as you look at the decisions. I mean, I've got to say that these decisions are cross-referenced in what I would call an American style. You read the American Supreme Court decisions and they're full of sniping back and forth. It's a, uh, almost a bitterness that's often expressed by the members of the court. These cases are pretty close to that, as between the Andrews purists and the relevant four. But Madam Justice Ledoux Dubé seems to be off spinning on her own here. And, and the other, court, other members of the court don't very much discuss her analysis. Now, Madam Justice Ledoux Dubé says that she is giving effect to the Andrews doctrine by understanding that really Andrews is one way of measuring a violation of human dignity. It's just that the courts have focused too much on this group connection. Now, the relevant four, Justice Gonche, Chief Justice Lemaire, Justice Major, Justice Lafaude, that's the other core faction on the court right now, clearly. Well, they're exploring a new frontier as well. It's a frontier that I suppose one could call um, tradition. Um, it's a frontier that we would call deference. Um, no? You think it's a frontier that we would call? I don't want to know. Um, terrifying. No, no, let's look at it. They all say, in, in, the, in the two major decisions, in Egan and in Miron and Trudell, they say that they are giving effect to something which is laying at the heart of Andrews all along. Like Madam Justice Ledoux Dubé, who's focusing on and trying to give primacy to the concept of discrimination, so are the relevant four. Now, they say that discrimination is giving effect to irrelevant characteristics in legislative classification. How do we measure discrimination? Well, we know discrimination when the state has acted on the basis of irrelevant personal characteristics. And so, therefore, the question is, in Section 15 analysis, whether or not the classification chosen by the state is relevant, quote-unquote. 
Why are they doing that? Well, I think that there's a series of, of reasons. I've heard it argued that they're doing it because they want to defer more to legislatures. You don't need to redo Section 15 to defer more to legislatures, quite frankly. That's not, that's, that's not necessary. Anybody who's read the Section 1 decisions could find lots of room for, for uh, deference in the Section 1 doctrine. In Irwin Toy and that line of decisions, you end up with the lowest level of rationality review. The court has said that in deciding whether or not discrimination is justified, the only question is whether or not the state had a reasonable basis for acting as it did. You could, you could put it the other way. Did the state act on the basis of an involuntary muscle spasm or was there some thought behind what it did? And if there was some thought behind what it did, under Irwin Toy in that line of Section 1 analysis, you don't need any more deference. There's plenty of deference to go around under Section 1 under that approach. So what is it that the relevant four are trying to do? Well, they're trying to define the concept of discrimination, I would, uh, I would argue, by again looking to where it's come from in Canadian law and looking to a particular type of its origins. Now really I would argue that what they're doing is re resurrecting a test that found favor under the Canadian Bill of Rights. I tried to explore it a little bit in my paper. It's this valid federal objective test. You remember the Canadian Bill of Rights cases? Any of you who have had the glory of looking at any of the equality cases? The Supreme Court under the Canadian Bill of Rights never really knew what it wanted to do with equality rights. It didn't feel confident in really subjecting laws to meaningful review. So the way around that was to say, okay, if you brought an equality claim, we would ask the government to justify it. And if it was a federal law that was being challenged, as very often it was, we would ask whether or not the law had been act enacted for a valid federal objective. That was the basic test for analysis uh, under the Canadian Bill of Rights at the time the Charter was enacted. Well, it sounds very much to me and has the features that are similar to this relevance test by the court. The court is, uh, this faction of the court is obviously trying to extricate the judges, not just from having to show deference to legislative choices, they're trying to extricate themselves from having to find discrimination at all. They don't want to uphold discriminatory laws as reasonable violations of rights, because that's really what they're asked to do under Section 1 if they're honest about it. They're asked to say the law is discriminatory, yes, but in the particular circumstances, it's okay. Now, they squeak through in McKinney and some other cases trying to do this, but I think what this faction has seen is that this is a difficult position to defend in very many of these cases. Once you get over the Section 15 threshold, it may be very difficult to offer a plausible rationale for upholding the law. So how do you avoid putting a court or a judge in that circumstance? you introduce a new element into Section 15, which allows considerations of justification to be brought forward. One of the remarkable things to me about the, about the decisions is the extent, the pains that the judges take, the extent to which they go to try to argue that they are simply giving effect to Oaks. They're not doing anything different than what was done in Oaks or in Andrews. This faction is very concerned about uh, not departing from that. Having said that, though, it's clear that they put a new hurdle in the way of a charter claimant and offered governments a new rationale. One of the most telling comments of all about this faction's approach, I would argue, is that of Mr. Justice Gonche when he's talking about whether or not this is really a departure from what's gone before on the charter. He says, look, we're not putting an unfair onus on the, on the charter claimant here. The charter claimant can bring forward uh, evidence and arguments about what this law's impact is on him or her, and can argue about the impact on the group and therefore make submissions about what is relevant. But he says, don't worry, because after all, this approach will encourage governments to, quote unquote, assist the court on this score as well. He's clearly thinking that governments will bring forward rationales as to why their distinction is relevant and by virtue of that, offer the court an opportunity to avoid having to get to section one. This is a strategy that is grounded in a particular understanding of the judicial role and a particular desire to limit the scope of that judicial role in equality cases. Anyone who's surprised by it, I would argue, hasn't been paying close enough attention to what's been going on in, the charter, uh, in charter land generally. Given that we caught the court on the downward slide, it's not surprising that this group has found that Andrews sets a test that they could not live with. 
Now the last of the, of the group, and I'll, I'll uh, talk very briefly, is the wandering soul, Mr. Justice Sapinka. I'm not really sure how to classify him, and I'm not sure that he knows how he wants to be classified. We know that in Egan, he aligns himself on section 15 with the Andrews purists. We know that in Midon and Trudell, he also aligns himself with the Andrews purists. In Thibodeau, for reasons that really I do not understand, he seems to, he seems to want to um, join both groups. Uh, he's joining Cory, Iacobucci, and Lafore. Uh, Lafore seems to be joining with Cory and Iacobucci. There's a, there's a problem in trying to understand what it is that he's doing, but the, the key problem, I guess, is what, what Justice Sapinka has done in Egan. Having aligned himself with the Andrews purists on section 15, he then even goes further than the relevant four under section 1. Justice Lafaudet didn't explore section 1 in Egan, obviously. He throws it off with a couple of line reference to McKinney. It's not even worthy of his attention to look at section 1 because there's no violation of section 15. So he doesn't need to explain how he would apply section, uh, uh, section 1 in the case. Read what I wrote in, uh, in McKinney and be done with it. Well, Justice Sapinka obviously is taking a new approach to section 1, but as I look at it, it seems to me that there's nothing really new there that there will be nothing of lasting significance to take from Justice Sapinka's approach in Egan. It's, it strikes me as having been um, done rather quickly and done without a lot of thought in terms of its implications or, uh, or its uh, application in respect of charter, land, uh, charter law generally. Sapinka is obviously concerned that the government here is allocating its own money and at a time when governments are largely running out of money, so we are being told time and again. He's obviously concerned about a court directing how government allocations of funds are to be done. He obviously believes that these claims are new and therefore, and government's recognition of these claims are new and the constitutional dimension of, uh, of uh, sexual orientation and same-sex benefits cases are new. And within all of that framework, he finds that this is not a time to force governments to act that it is appropriate for the, for the court to step back from forcing governments to act. Now that's a remarkable, on one level, a remarkably honest participation in what he thinks of as a constitutional dialogue. It's also, though, remarkably bereft of the other side of the equation, it seems to me. The other side of the equation should have to at least take account of the Parliamentary Committee Report on Equality Rights, if we're looking at a federal government. The government's response in 1986 to a Parliamentary Committee Report on Equality Rights, which basically said that sexual orientation was going to be recognized under Section 15, that the state had better get its act together in deciding how benefits in relation to this ought to, uh, ought to flow. It had to some, surely take some account of Hague, 1992, decision of the Ontario Court of Appeal, which the federal government, as we know, decided not to appeal, and which therefore said something about federal government awareness of the nature of these claims. It should have said something surely about Leshner, about the fact that very clearly in Leshner, a little laser beam of light was pointed on particular problems in federal legislation in respect of same-sex benefits. And it was clear as well at that time that, and since, that this was an issue that was a matter of public debate. I've gone too long and I should stop. So I'll leave you with a couple of very brief uh, ideas that I would take from the totality of all of this. It used to be that if you wanted equality, you could go to the Supreme Court. I have a friend who litigates for the Manitoba Commission and if you've ever looked at some of the decisions of the Manitoba Court of Appeal on discrimination or human rights law, he had a wonderful line when he was seeking leave to appeal in the Supreme Court, which was that I'm appealing from the decision of the Manitoba Court of Appeal, but I've got some other reasons as well. Um, it used to be that if you wanted equality, you went to the Supreme Court because the legislatures really weren't extending it. Lower courts and tribunals were adopting very stilted and narrow and artificial and unreal or surreal approaches to equality. The Supreme Court cut through all of that not by pointing to particular academic theorists, not by doing, simply by the exercise of simple common sense. The court said that we must try to understand how discrimination operates in this society, in the private domain. And we're gonna to have to try and make a law, set up a legal framework that's effective in allowing those problems to be addressed. So we're not gonna require intent to be proven. 
we're not going to import other types of limitations on corporate liability. Right? We're going to allow very wide sweeping remedies, forward looking and backward looking remedies to be devised to try to get at the root of this problem as it operates, particularly in the private sector, in employment by and large. Those are the cases that the courts looked at. In equality law though, I'm not so sure that this court is indicating that it's very useful to go looking for that sort of understanding of how the state operates, how legislation is actually made, and finally how legislation actually operates. Because one of the things that's very clear from all of these decisions is about evidence about how the law is made will not necessarily be binding. In some cases won't even be looked to. Evidence about how the law operates in practice will not necessarily be binding either for a majority of the court. I would submit that what the court is, is indicating is that it's still very much struggling with the understanding it has of what it can do under equality rights as it tries to blunt, shape, and direct state action. It's not really sure what tests will usefully be applied. There is a group that are sticking with Andrews but ultimately applying a very low level of review. There's a, there's a group that are introducing new elements of relevance and tradition into Section 15 analysis, analysis and are thereby trying to blunt the review. There's the individualist who's off uh, trying to look more directly at these questions and there's just a Sapinka wandering through uh, the decisions, not really sure, I, I think yet, of where it is that, that he wants to fit, although he does seem to align himself with the, with the purists. It seems to me that we should be looking to this court for a more principled understanding of equality as it has to apply in respect of limiting and prompting state action. I don't think that we've got it from these judgments. I think rather what we've got is something that will turn out to be transient like so many of the other decisions of this court. The court had clearly through the trilogy by releasing it together, by working on it as a group, tried to achieve a consensus of its own views. Clearly it hasn't done that yet in terms of these cases. There's some very ad hoc decision making here and um, there are trial balloons that are being floated on several sides. So it seems to me that the trilogy, though it's important, really marks a step uh, along uh, an evolution. It's not the end of the path, that's, uh, that's for sure. And I doubt that the relevant four will gather more than four. And I'm not sure that the Andrews purists are going to manage to gather uh, Justice Apinka into their fold consistently either. It seems to me that what this may signal is that we've now entered this awful, awful, awful period of American style. I agree with par parts one and three, but on part four, that learned justice is way out to line. This type of splintering of analysis. What does that mean in terms of cases that we're doing? Well, I think that it means that we've got to pay more attention to legislative records on all sides so that we can at least try to force the court to pay some attention to what it is the legislature said was their purpose in adopting the law, I think. It seems to me that on the plaintiff side, we have to pay much more attention to legislative history and lobbying efforts. If you were looking at doing a sexual orientation benefits case now, say one against the federal government, for example, what would you look to? Well, I would urge you to look beyond the traditional types of, of legal materials we should be seeing the briefs that have been submitted to government in favor of extending these benefits. We should be looking for letters from ministers saying what it is that is the government's position in respect of this. We should be looking to see that the court can no longer say, well, you know, the legislatures are looking at this and they're, they're taking their time with it. Because ultimately, surely, you can't take forever. Now that, I think, is really what we're looking to from a court to say that equality should move forward in this society, that legislatures need not always lead, but they can only lag so far behind. Now the key area obviously that I'm thinking of is sexual orientation. Legislatures are not leading. How could Justice Apinka writes what he writes, confident in the expectation that history has shown that the spousal allowance has been extended step by step when we know that every claim for same-sex benefits in Parliament right now since 1986 has run headlong into absolute opposition. Government ministers remain committed and have been committed since 1986 to amending the Canadian Human Rights Act. This isn't extending real benefits to anybody. People who complain to the Human Rights Commission tell me all the time that it's hard to see it as a benefit because you're getting drawn into a system that's maybe not so much fun to be in the middle of. But in any case, the narrowest, smallest, little legislative step along this path since 1986 
has not moved forward one iota. Now, if you're looking for equality from a court, it seems to me, you've got to ask that court to pay attention to its part in the constitutional debate. Clearly, the court doesn't have to lead all the time. But I would submit that the court shouldn't let Parliament lag so far behind our current understanding or appreciation of equality as it needs to be in this society and at this time. It may be too much to expect, but I don't think it's too much to ask. Thank you. On your behalf, I thank Bill for his remarks, uh, provocative and, and get us going this morning. I'd, I'd now like to introduce Mary Eberts, um, who is no doubt familiar to, to all of you. Uh, she's a partner in the law firm of Eberts, Simonson Street. Uh, she was counsel to Scope, uh, an intervener in the Thibodeau case, and that is the, uh, the case that uh, we've asked her to look at particularly, although I expect her thoughts will range as they always do. Um, Mary is, uh, of course, one of the most prominent uh, um, rights lawyers in this country, particularly equality rights lawyers, and um, a senior counsel on behalf of LEAF and in, in involved in these issues from the very beginning. Uh, nobody knows uh, more about it or has been involved with it more than she has, so we're very fortunate to have her today. Mary? Thank you, David. Um, one of the titles of my talk is uh, Formal and Substantive Equality. And then there's also this little note in here about the boys versus the girls. That's Corbett's idea. That wasn't my idea. I think uh, he meant it to, to have many layers of meaning. Um, but of course, he can speak for himself later on. One obvious layer of meaning is that uh, it is remarkable how, at least up until this uh, general scattering in uh, uh, Egan and Myron, how the women judges seemed to see certain things that the men judges didn't. And that was a trend, or that was a, a very remarkable aspect of the Symes decision, and it has uh, carried over uh, to a certain extent into Thibodeau. Uh, it's also, I think, um, true that. Uh, when men bring forward claims, unless of course they are not real men, um, they tend to be more successful than women. So that's another sort of boys and girls note. But um, this not being my idea and my having exhausted my interpretive abilities uh, on it, uh, even as I speak, um, what I want to do now is turn to um, some general remarks on these cases ending up with uh, the Thibodeau case. Basically, as you'll see, uh, I must admit at the beginning, there is no paper for me in these materials. And this was in spite of the fact that I accepted this speaking engagement, knowing that I would have been working out in the general division last uh, week uh, on uh, Egan and uh, Myron, and to a lesser extent, Thibodeau. I thought that I would know exactly what I wanted to say after having prepared this case. However, I find, and I've read these decisions several times now, I find that the disarray in the, in the three decisions is so devastating that it's sort of hard to figure out what to say about them. Uh, you're in a, a situation where you're actually trying to, um, your analytical efforts actually may impart more logic and meaning to what they're doing than they are themselves, and you might get sort of deluded by that. The theme that emerged finally in my anxious pondering of this um, is one that calls uh, to mind some old science fiction movies. You remember The Incredible Vanishing Woman? Well, that's where I started given the great diminishment of women's rights in the courts uh, when we thought uh, with the LEAF and other litigation agendas that perhaps we would augment or expand women's rights. But more particularly, what we have in these decisions is the incredible vanishing section, and I mean section 15. Thibodeau, Egan, and Myron are, I think, a watershed uh, 
uh, in the gra in the gradual dim uh, diminishment of Section 15 that has been happening at least since the um, McKinney case, uh, probably Irwin Toy, they seem to go together. There are some trends in this, but in order to start out, let me talk about Andrews and uh, a little sidebar uh, with the Oaks uh, case, just to, beginning, just to begin. I suppose I'm what uh, Bill would call an, an uh, Andrews purist. I was uh, one of the counsel in Andrews, and I was pleased to see that a lot of the ideas that we put forward in the Leaf Factum were accepted by the court. That was just a few brief years ago, and their lifespan seems to have been quite short. Um, let me just recall to mind, however, some of the things that the uh, Anders case uh, stood for. Importantly, given the current method of approaching issues in these three cases, Andrews was very strong in its rejection of the similarly situate test. And I'll return to this in a minute, but you know the, the basic rationale of the test was that where two entities or persons are similarly situate in the same situation, they should receive the same legal treatment. Well, for those of you uh, who remember or have read about the bad old Canadian Bill of Rights days, this was a formulation that led to much exotic dancing on the heads of many pins because the whole method of analysis under the Canadian Bill of Rights similarly situate test was to get the groups. And there was a, a mad sort of definitional dance on the head of, of these pins, sort of here's how I define my group and here's how I define the referent group, uh, the rights of which I aspire to. And then your opponent would say, no, 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 you've defined them differently. Here's how I define your group, and I define away the problem. And of course, the courts would do that as well. They would say, well, there isn't really a, a situation here where they are similarly situate. They are differently situate, and therefore, different treatment in law is fine. In addition to rejecting the similarly situate test, the um, court in Oaks, or the court in Anders, emphasized that one of the purposes of Section 15 is the promotion of equality. Now that is a stage of the rocket that has totally fallen away by the time we get to Thibodeau, Egan, and Myron. Another key element of the Anders test, or the Anders case, was that Section 15, promoting as it does equality, applies in the formulation as well as the administration of the law. That is something that people urging reform upon the government had uh, long called for application of the equality guarantees to the substance of the law as well as its administration. One of the other major points of the Andrews uh, case uh, where the Supreme Court of Canada overruled the BC Court of Appeal was that the approach that you analyze the or identify the purpose and objective of the statute and analyze how well the statute fulfills that purpose within the context of section 1 and not the context of section 15. So in the context of section 15 you look at whether there is a breach of the equality guarantees and then you switch over switching indeed the burden of proof to uh, section 1. And uh, my Oaks sidebar that I was mentioning is that uh, the Supreme Court in Oaks imposed a very strong onus on the government to justify uh, limitations on uh, all rights. And the Andrews case um, picked up that strong onus and also applied it to the equality rights, which is something that um, equality seekers had hoped for, that Section 15 would not be isolated on the sidelines of the development of the Charter's guarantees, but would have the same Section 1 test applied to it as was available to others. Now, I see the trilogy uh, at this point uh, as maybe for now, unfortunately, the bottom of a slide that started a while ago. Um, Bill has alluded to uh, some of this. Um, it began uh, rather mildly in Irwin Toy, where the court uh, talked about legislative line drawing and talked about uh, two different approaches to Section 1. You remember where uh, the government is the adversary of the individual and in such a case uh, 
we think of criminal law as the typical paradigm of this situation, then the government has a very strong obligation to justify its laws. In a situation where the government is mediating different social interests, or drawing lines, or allocating resources of one sort or another, then the court would cut the legislature more slack, would let it balance those interests. The legislature would have more leeway as long as there was some reasonable basis for what uh, it did. And the court at that stage, in Irwin Toy and also in McKinney, would consider what evidence, what social science data, what factual evidence was before the legislature when it made its choices. Another element of uh, McKinney in particular that surfaces with a vengeance in uh, Mr. Justice Sapinka's judgment in Egan is that the legislature doesn't have to solve an underlying social problem all at once. This incrementalism that is permitted um, is, I think, one of our first major signs that uh, the court is hankering after more peaceful days when the legislature dealt with all equality problems and the courts didn't have to worry about it. But at least at the stage of Irwin, Toy, and McKinney, we were still dealing with a Section 1 analysis, and the courts were purporting or trying to address some questions within the framework of Section 1. What's happened since then is that the analysis has backed up substantially into Section uh, 15, uh, and we see that in the Symes case, where before they were prepared to, uh, or they refused to, to find that uh, there was a violation because they performed what they call a contextual analysis. They looked at the whole scheme of the legislation and not just the impugned portion uh, of the legislation. Um, and this contextual analysis is actually a perversion of what uh, was said in um, the Big M Drug Mart case where we were exhorted to take a very contextual approach to the Charter's guarantees, to look at the history, to look at where they are in the Charter, to look at the previous kinds of guarantees that were in existence. Um, the court twists that exhortation to a broad approach into a more narrow approach saying, let's look at the whole legislation and see how they do in the whole scheme. There was a further level of retraction evident in Symes, evident also in the NWAC case. Uh, and this is uh, really the Supreme Court of Canada behaving like a trial court. And they were saying, not just we don't find a Section 15 violation because we're approaching this contextually, but there are no facts here. Now, I have got over thinking that it's kind of you know, untoward of me to mention this because I was criticized in that judgment for not marshalling the facts that would demonstrate that uh, discrimination was um, taking place. But um, I take great comfort from the dissenting judges, and this is where one of the sort of girls versus boy themes comes in. The dissenting judges in Symes had no trouble recognizing on the factual record before the court that there was a disproportionate responsibility for childcare expenses as well as childcare duties, which rested upon women. So at least two judges up there read the voluminous record as um, underscoring the factual contentions we were making. But this is a court, generally speaking, in the majority, that is fully in retreat from the difficult balancing that must be done under Section 1. It is increasingly restive with that role. It doesn't want to be always faced with the, well, was the legislature right or wrong? So it pulls itself up and says, well, I can avoid or we can avoid doing that if we just define the problem out of existence and say there is no difficulty here. And they do it by manipulating the meaning of Section 15, the definition of the problem, or by saying there was no uh, factual basis. In the trilogy, uh, we have almost reached the um, vanishing point. We see um, uh, a number of features in the, uh, the, the so-called Gang of Four, uh, and their analysis based on uh, the, relevant, uh, the, the relevancy of these characteristics to the functional values underlying the law. But we also see um, a tightening up 
of the excuses that have been used up to this point for um, not dealing with uh, the, the major questions before them. Um, for example, the, uh, the uh, lafaure gontier approach in Egan and in Myron uh, f features a three-part analysis of whether discrimination has occurred. Is there a distinction? Is there discrimination? And is it based on an irrelevant personal characteristic? And they ask whether the characteristic is irrelevant to the functional values underlying the law. This is the object test imported up from Section 1 into Section 15. And very significantly, they have not only done that, but um, just sort of grinding down further what was done in Symes, they also say that uh, this uh, analysis of the objective and the functional values done in the, the context of Section 15 must be done in that good old contextual approach. Uh, so that um, we see Lafaure and Egan quoting uh, Gontier from uh, Myron saying, it is dangerous to focus narrowly on a particular provision. A more comprehensive contextual approach must be taken to determine the relevancy of the personal characteristic in question to the functional values underlying the law. So they look at the full uh, catastrophe uh, before they uh, come to their decision. So what we have, I think now, in, particularly in the Gang of Four, is um, people have, who have gone right back to the definitional dance of the similarly situate test under the Canadian Bill of Rights. And the others uh, in, on the court, particularly I would say uh, sometimes, Justices Yakabuchi, Corey, and McLaughlin, I'm leaving aside uh, Justice Sapinka and Justice Lura Dubé, uh, for more or less the same reasons as, as uh, Bill left them in idiosyncratic categories of their own. We see, uh, at best, in these others, uh, the kind of anxious, uh, overly deferential to the legislature, overly uh, nervous, timid uh, judges trying not to deal with the essential equality issues and the essential equality analysis. Um, right back in the sort of McKinney Symes low watermark, but at least, at least not fully pulled up into Section 15, and at least as to some of them, still prepared to look at the facts and to look at the concrete situation before them. Now, I would think that, um, you know, in saying this about uh, where the trilogy has left us, um, I would like to be able to say, like Bill, well, here's what we do given this situation. I am all too painfully reminded of the fact that by the time we got to where we were under the Canadian Bill of Rights and the similarly situate test and the definitional dance that took place there, it took fully blown constitutional reform process to blast us out of it. Um, and you see in the Andrews case, specifically Justice McIntyre mentioning when he's interpreting Section 15, this part was here because of this case. This part was here because of the other case. And he cites uh, Lavelle, he cites Bliss, specifically saying that this section was put in place to take us away from the constricted approach that the similarly situate test and the definitional dance had wrought. Um, I think um, that our only hope at the moment is uh, twofold. One, that by analyzing quite keenly what's going on here, we can develop uh, some overall education of the Supreme Court judges by the bar uh, that will sort of bring them back into the mainstream of analyzing this problem. But the other thing is that by continuing to make arguments at the trial court level and continuing to expose the reasoning of the Supreme Court for what it is, we may show uh, trial judges in substantial enough numbers that um, the uh, reasoning is so frail and so inimical to the purposes of the Charter that uh, the lower court judges will become restive under the yoke of, of the Supreme Court's decisions on Section 15 and they'll force the issue back up into a climate that we have had a chance better to influence. Let me just take you through a few things that um, sort of 
are more specific examples of what I've been talking about. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, th my starting place, I guess, again, for this particular review is Anders and the Law Society of British Columbia, particularly the reasons of uh, Mr. Justice McIntyre and his, uh, initially, his attack on the similarly situate uh, proviso. Just to give you an example of what I mean when I say we're right back there, um, he was um, analyzing the, the um, jurisprudence under the uh, Canadian Bill of Rights dealing with the Indian Act, Gonzales and Dry Bones. And he had, uh, in particular, dealing with the decision of the, uh, of in Gonzales from the BC Court of Appeal, he pointed out that Mr. Justice Tyso had said that equality before the law could not mean the same laws for all persons and define the right to mean the right in every person to whom a particular law relates or extends uh, to have that law administered uh, equally. So it's, it's like, um, you know, the, the right of rich and poor alike to sleep under the subways. And so you, uh, you get the situation where, you know, it's pretty key to define your group and to be able to define it in a sense that, that um, lets you manipulate that test. And in Andrews, as I said, there's a formulation of law that is caught, as well as its administration. But if you look closely to Mr. Justice Gontier's reasons in Thibodeau, there is rather a frightening hearkening back to Tyso in Gonzales. He says um, in paragraph 91 of, its, of his reasons, talking about the Income Tax Act, he, sa he talks about, um, he says, well, we have to apply the charter to the Income Tax Act, but the special nature of the act has an impact not on how we interpret the right, but on what the right is. What is the right to equality in this context? So he's reading the nature of the act back up into the meaning of the right. And he says, um, the very essence of the ITA is to make distinctions so as to generate revenue for the government while equitably reconciling a range of necessarily divergent interests. In view of this, the right to the equal benefit of the law cannot mean that each taxpayer has an equal right to receive the same amounts, deductions, or benefits, but merely a right to be equally governed by the law. Does that not sound like Tyso? Does that not sound like the passage from Tyso that was rejected in Andrews? You have a right to be equally governed by the law. Well, it's meaningless, except as an affirmation of whatever the legislature does, it applies to you, it applies to you just as much as it applies to all the other people who are subject to the law, and therefore you're fine. Uh, so um, then, then he goes on to develop his irrelevant uh, personal um, characteristic. And just to go back to Andrews, um, Justice McIntyre says a similarly situate test focusing on the equal application of the law to those to whom it has application could lead to results akin to those in bliss. So they specifically reject it, and now we're back. We're back at the equal application of the law. One of the other things that goes on in these cases, and I just want to take you through the three of them, to show that we are dealing here, importantly, I think, we're dealing with cases that by and large are about formal equality. This is not something that you know, requires rocket science to understand. Formal equality is the less complicated type of equality claim. Namely, I'm more or less, as they emphasize throughout, this is a comparative analysis, I'm like that guy over there, and he or she gets this in the statute, and I want it too. It's plain on the face of the statute what's going on. You don't have to look at the effect of it, the administration of it, or anything. It's facial discrimination we're talking about. It's formal equality. And one of the things that happens uh, in these cases, even while they're looking at formal equality, is the definitional dance. And you'll see the judges characterizing the distinctions in a way that uh, promotes the uh, sort of the result that they want to get to. For example, just to take a, a pair of characterizations from the Egan uh, case, La Foray, uh, really identifies the purpose of the legislation and therefore characterizes what's at issue here uh, as um, the uh, reasons 
for which Parliament has sought to favour heterosexuals who live as married couples. So that's the issue. We've, we immediately are dumped right into this marriage issue. Married couples is part of his definitional characteristic. And then he goes on to characterize the issue to accord support to married couples who are aged and elderly. Um, and he says it would be possible to legally define marriage to include homosexual couples, but this would not change the biological and social realities that underlie the traditional marriage. And he specifically rejects that homosexual couples can approximate themselves to this uh, biological and social reality. Mr. Justice Corey, in distinction, I mean, he's prepared to at least look at this and find that discrimination has gone on. He takes a totally different characterization of the problem. It's not homosexuals versus married couples, with all of the holy connotations of that approach. Mr. Justice Corey says, to say that the distinction is between spouses and non-spouses is to avoid the very issue which is presented by the legislation in this case, namely the definition of a spouse. He says, appellants are not challenging the parliamentary decision to confer benefits on spousal as opposed to non-spousal households. What is in dispute is whether, having decided to confer a benefit on common law spouses, the legislation may then employ a definition of spouse which discriminates on the basis of sexual orientation. He de-escalates it. He drops it down a level, it sort of unwinds the cone. Um, the same definitional dance you find in the pairs of characterizations in Myron and Trudell. Uh, and uh, I don't want to go into a lot of detail uh, in this because I still have a few things to say about Thibodeau. But I thought when I read Myron and Trudell of the Supreme Court of Canada's decision in the Persons case. This was one of the first Supreme Court of Canada decisions I devoted a lot of serious analysis to because I had to teach it when I first started teaching. And it occurred to me, I, I discovered this uh, sitting in my office by myself, and of course, when you discover something, you always become very attached to it. I thought, these people, the majority in the Supreme Court of Canada, are, they're saying, we do not want to read the word persons to include women because that would be to accomplish a fundamental social revolution by, I think they said, stealthy means. I think they used the term stealthy. And then they proceeded to perform the most acrobatic, sort of twisted up, uh, volatile legal analysis that you could possibly find totally wrenching legislative history out of context, misapplying facts, all kinds of things. It was a radical analysis and radical judicial craftsmanship uh, in the service of a very conservative social objective. And when you see what Gontier, and particularly Gontier, but Lafaurie and his train do with their marriage rationale and their couple rationale in Myron and in Egan, that is exactly what they're doing. They are going to great and somewhat foolish legal lengths to support a common, uh, a, a social uh, conservative uh, objective. And again, they, uh, Gontier characterizes this as a marriage issue. And he says, the distinction drawn by the legislation at issue is made on the basis of marriage and the appellants have rested their whole argument upon the premise that their situation is identical to that of married couples and carries with it the same consequences. This is the simplest sort of formal equality claim going. And then he proceeds to analyze support obligations in Canadian law. And he more or less says that the support obligations that exist between married couple come from natural law. I mean, there is no other way of explaining what he does. They come from natural law. Perhaps they come from heaven. They're, you know, previously ordained. From reading his material in this judgment, you would think that the legislature of no Canadian province had ever legislated on the issue of support, that there had never been uh, the Deserted Wives and Children's Maintenance Act, that there had never been the Family Law Reform Act, that there had never been a section of the Family Law Act in Ontario saying that both spouses are equally responsible for their own support and laying out a number of criteria. You'd think that that had never happened. 
And if you know the history of support, you know that it has been one of the mightiest battles in the reform of the common and statute law affecting women to get support obligations recognized from the middle of the 19th century on up through. It doesn't come from natural law and from the sanctity of marriage and from the biological bond. It comes from 150 years of hard slogging in the courts and the legislatures. And then he turns around and he contrasts um, the, uh, the uh, argument of the, uh, of the couple in Myron and Trudell that, well, after all, um, the, uh, the, he says, um, only in cases where the legislator imposes a support obligation on unmarried couples does it exist. So he sees it as a legislative artifact, whereas the married couple, by choosing to become married, sort of opts into a situation of mutual support. Uh, so he says, the nature of the support obligations of unmarried couples and those of married couples is, in essence, very different. Um, and he totally rejects the argument based on the Ontario Law Reform Act, or Ontario Family Law uh, Act. So again, this, this judicial, um, sort of wonky judicial craftsmanship in the service of a very conservative social objective. These, um, the last case I want to talk about is uh, Thibodeau. Um, the irony of all of this uh, trilogy, I suppose, is that Mr. Nesbitt and Mr. Egan were together since 1948, and they couldn't get the uh, legal treatment uh, or the benefits at law that a married couple or uh, a lived-together heterosexual couple could get. And Suzanne Thibodeau was divorced and she couldn't stop being considered at law as a member of a married couple. I mean, this, uh, the Thibodeau case puts you in mind of Blackstone's uh, um, dictum that was often quoted in the Family Law Reform Act Wars, um, the man and the wife are one person and that one is the husband. Because the analysis, again, is a sort of a definitional dance. And I, I won't go into the details of it, but I will give you a few representative judgments. Um, the uh, Suzanne Thibodeau and Scope, uh, the intervener that uh, uh, intervened on her uh, to support her, made an argument that is uh, almost entirely taken up by Madam Justice uh, McLaughlin in her dissenting judgment. And it's based on, in essence, looking at the reality of what happens in separated couples. Look at the facts, please. Look at the fact that this legislation produces a benefit in only two-thirds of the cases, and it has a neutral or a negative effect on the overall couple in a third of the cases. Look at the facts that uh, this legislation has an adverse impact on custodial parents, 97% of whom are women, in that they must pay more tax, they don't get to deduct their support obligation uh, as the non-custodial parent does. Not only must they pay that uh, or pay tax on that, they also have to pay tax on the husband's or ex-husband's support obligation. So they were saying, Suzanne Thibodeau was saying, consider me as an individual. Look at me as a single no, uh, custodial mother who has some income and custody of the children and so on. She had a very specific characterization of herself that she wanted to use. Uh, and if you look at the judgment in um, uh, Madam Justice McLaughlin, you'll see she accepts that characterization. What I mean by the definitional dance in Thibodeau, though, is that the Supreme Court of Canada majority totally characterized that definition away and said the group contemplated by the legislation consists of separated or divorced couples in which one parent is paying alimony to the other under a judgment or agreement. And they specifically said, and this is uh, uh, in uh, paragraph, 40, uh, paragraph 140 of Gonchi's uh, judgment, the fact that the tax saving resulting from the inclusion deduction, deduction system does not benefit both parents in equal proportion therefore does not infringe the equality rights protected by the Charter. Because the couple as a whole is benefited, we are not going to look underneath the rock. We're not going to turn it over. We're not going to see that disproportionately the benefit 
goes to the non-custodial father and disproportionately the burden goes to the mother. And uh, this uh, insult is added to the injury of this characterization uh, when uh, Justices Corey and Iacobucci uh, call this, uh, they say, if anything, the legislation in question confers a benefit on the post-divorce family unit. It is clear that the divorced parents still function as a unit when it comes to providing financial and emotional support to their children and that both parents remain under a legal obligation to provide this support. Well, you could stop there because both parents being under a legal obligation to provide support, they are treated totally differently in the Tax Act. The father who has a legal obligation to provide support gets to deduct the total amount that he pays pursuant to that obligation. The mother who is under a legal obligation to pay support must pay taxes on the income that she uses to support her children that she generates and also on the income of the father to pay support. So although they are both under a legal obligation, we are to stop there and not look at the in fact differences between them. Uh, so uh, I'm sure uh, Professor Moran will have more to say about the characterization of uh, the family in um, this uh, magical trilogy of cases. But uh, let me just finish on the note of Madam Justice McLaughlin. In her uh, judgment, starting at paragraph 174, she goes through a recitation of what are actually the facts about this situation. She does not smother the facts in this gloss of, well, the unit is the family unit and we don't care about differences between them. She looks at the difference in the application of the law. And as I said uh, uh, previously, I mean, if, we're, if we have two main camps in the Supreme Court of Canada at the present time, I would say that one camp is the uh, people who have sucked up all of the analysis into Section 15 and they're screwing the screws down on it tighter and tighter and tighter in a definitional dance that's very similar to the Canadian Bill of Rights analysis that was discredited in Anders. And on the other side, you have the tired remnants of uh, the Supreme Court's approach under Anders and Oakes, even as watered down in McKinney and Irwin Toy. And at best, those judges can be seen to be Madam Justice McLaughlin, uh, Justices Corey and Iacobucci, sometimes, sometimes Sapinka, and although she's not, uh, she doesn't say the same things as they do. I mean, Laura Dubé is with them in spirit, I'm sure. Um, this is not a happy situation for an advocate. Um, I think um, practical suggestions include the never-ending um, search to have the perfect evidentiary record, the absolutely perfect evidentiary record so that they don't have refuge in facts, that they are forced to eat their way into the legal arguments. Um, that's often very difficult to put together, especially if you come into a case later rather than sooner, and especially as their reasoning lately has been unpredictable enough that you never know what part of the factual record they're going to want to focus on. So you, you can't tell in advance what you should have there, uh, what absence they will, they will hit upon to justify what they're doing. So as you can see, I'm uh, some sort of cynical counsel uh, about all of this, disappointed uh, that the promise of the Charter and that the uh, promise of Anders and Oaks with their uh, imperfections uh, acknowledgedly, um, and the, even the efforts that the court was making to hand wrestle the arguments under Section 15 and Section 1 have been uh, abandoned or have exhausted the court so thoroughly. Uh, I think what we need now is, uh, you know, uh, I don't think we'll have another round of constitutional reform. I think we need a huge storm of writing and of arguing about these issues in as many academic and public forums as we can so that we can um, try to get the court to pick up its flagging energies and look again at the serious substantive issues that are in these sections. Thank you.